Hey, welcome in. It's the John Cast Podcast. Thank you for listening to this podcast brought to you, as always, by Ian's Pizza in Madison. They've got three locations in Madison. They've got three locations in Milwaukee. So go check out Ian's Pizza. They've always got new slices of pizza that you can check out. Ian's is a proud sponsor. And we're working on our next uh, little promotion, Ian's Pizza and this podcast. We'll get uh, something to you here shortly. Um, but thank you to Ian's Pizza. Check out johncastpodcast.com. Sign up for the newsletter. Rate and review the podcast on Apple, on Spotify, wherever you get your podcast. Rate and reviews really do help propel the podcast forward. But today's guest is the head coach of the Wisconsin volleyball team. Also, it's a double guest show because beat writer from the Wisconsin State Journal, Dennis Punzel and Kelly Sheffield are both of my guests here today. Dennis, Kelly, thank you for joining the John Cast podcast. How's everybody doing today? Doing great here. Doing well here. It's great to be on with you guys again. We haven't done one of these in a while. No, we haven't. And you're not at your office. Where? Where? What's going on? Where are you right now? You're outside because it. Where I'm at, it's too cold to be outside to do a podcast. Uh, it's it's a. Uh, I'm in Santiago, Chile. Uh, actually, we're just outside of there right now because we're we're down at a uh, at a beach house for uh, for a few days. Uh, it's summer down here. My. My brother, Sean, and his wife, Mary Cruz, they have one-year-old twins, and uh, we're all down here hanging out with them. So my parents and uh, uh, my sister, Cami, and her family, so we've got a large group down here in Santiago. That is awesome. That is, what's the temperature? It's summertime there. Is it kind of ch more chill, or not chilly, but kind of cooler? Uh, well, we're, it's really sweet where we're at. We're kind of right up against the, the Andes Mountains and um, uh, and the ocean. Uh, right now, it's probably mid sixties. Yeah. Right now, we're about three hours ahead of you, of you guys. Uh, yesterday was a beach day. It's in Santiago. It was in the eighties, but right here, it's probably high sixties, low seventies. Hmm. Very cool. Very cool. How long are you going to be there? Uh, just under two weeks. Oh, fantastic! I wish I could go to Chile. Or Colombia, or my dad's from, or where would you go, Dennis, if you could go anywhere? Uh, Australia oh, or really? New Zealand. Yeah, that'd be a fun, fun Just spot. I think. Long, it takes a long time to get there. I, I hear. Yeah, a lot of plane travel. So Kelly, so tell me, what's the first thing you do? You go to Chile when the season's over, or what's the first thing you do when the season ends uh, in 2022? What's the what's kind of the the, the checklist for you? You know, it's uh, it, it was this year. You know, I mean, like I said, we've got we've got uh, two young ones that everybody wanted to kind of see and be around. Um, you know, certainly the weather is nice, but it, traveling right after the season is really. I mean, it, you really got to get get up for it because it's the last thing we any of us in our family want to do is just go and pack and get on a plane and go go stay somewhere else. Um, but uh, so tra traveling is is usually not uh, uh, a constant, but uh, this year it certainly is. And we'll be here for a little bit. And then uh, then uh, about the second week of January, uh, Anne-Marie Hickey and myself uh, will be going to uh, Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. Um, and we're gathering with a bunch of coaches and doing kind of a um, – uh, a deeper dive into volleyball analytics Oh, uh, with some other, coaches, some other programs uh, around the country. I think there's probably about uh, eight or 10 of us uh, coaches uh, and, and we get to bring our wives. Uh, that'll be down there for about four or five days trying to, trying to see if we can, uh, you know, what else we can do with, with our, uh, with our game from an analytical standpoint. That's pretty interesting. And I, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about like the off season now that we're into it, but I think we should probably start um, at the beginning of the season and kind of, kind of put a bow on 2022. So, um, you know, what was, if you had to recap the season and describe it in maybe a, a sentence or two, like, <laughs> I don't know, or maybe it, it, a couple probably of a sentence or two, probably. Do I guess? <laughs> so, you know, the start of it was really interesting, right? I mean, because we 
we had a, a, a really a changing of the guard, if you will, with so many elite players that graduated with, you know, Hilly, Retke, Loberg, Barnes, and Chavita. Um, you know, those are those aren't just excellent players, but they're players that have played a lot of matches in their career. And so uh, we're changing systems. We've got some transfers that are coming in. Uh, we're, you know, new leadership. Remember, Danielle Hart was still on a on a count early on. So she was I think the first couple of weeks she was allowed to play one set um, each match. And so um, it. it we're a team that's trying to find its way, um, I, I would guess. And then we're, we're about a, a few days away from leaving Dallas, and um, uh, and we got a, a bomb dropped on us about um, uh, the pictures and videos uh, that that I think we all know about. We had to um, we had to deal with, and we had to go and talk to our team and let them know what was what was going on. That these were these things were about ready to 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 go viral, and they were in some dark corners of the web. And it that was a man that that um, right before the season. I mean, days before we head over there, and we're trying to manage that and talk with family members and and the police and everything. Um, and we get down there to, uh, and then we're also getting the news about Chanel because we're we're trying to work with the NCA of um, trying to uh, to make her eligible. And at the point, she had said that she was not eligible at all. And we're going back and forth, and and we get down there to to, um, to Dallas two days early, and we're there, and just all of this stuff that's just coming from us. A week earlier, we had a, a recruit on campus that had just committed. We were about ready to have another uh, recruit on campus the following weekend. So we're down there and, and I tell Britt and I said, um, Britt, we, get, we, we gotta get out of here. Like get it out of the hotel room. We, we're down there a couple of days early. I said, find, find a tournament down there to go recruit to. And uh, she said, all right, there's a really big one. It's about three and a half hours away. I said, let's go get a car. Let's go, we're out of here. So we drive down there, we get into the gym, we start watching some kids and we're looking around and we're like, man, there's, I can't even believe there's not a single co college coach here. That's unbelievable. Like, well, everybody's obviously locked in on the first week. So we're sitting there, we're there for about an hour and a half. And all of a sudden she gets a text message and says, um, I hear you recruiting from another big 10 coach. What are you doing? And uh, it's a quiet period. And she shows me the text. She goes, let me call our compliance office. I go, no, <laughs> we're getting out of here. And uh, we walk. And as we're walking out the door, I call our compliance. And uh, I, I think we just <laughs> accidentally just had a recruiting violation here. And um, she's like, all right, well, fill me in when you get back and, and let's go. And, and uh, as we're driving the three and a half hours back, we get a call from the NCA saying, all right, we cut it from the full season to 14. You got all of this from I me, mean, just this tornado of activity going going into our first match, which was which was kind of an insane time. And um uh you know it's uh you know and and we lose in five to to Baylor uh on our second match, a really good Baylor team that um and then, uh, and then probably about a month later, a month and a half later, and then we get the the real avalanche because it finally had gone public. We'd known about this, and we'd been, you know, there'd been somebody behind the scenes that was just, you know, really almost torturing <laughs> everybody with how they were going about it. And uh, and you know, when we get into the season. And uh, there was about two weeks there where I'm not even sure we really practiced much. It was mostly just talking to our team, uh, talking with the, the, having the police come in, having the different people uh, helping our players through how to deal with things in public, um, how to, uh, uh, you know, having a session on, all right, we go to, onto the road. How do we handle crowds and preparing them for that? Uh, how do you walk into an elevator and feeling safe? Uh, how do you manage things? We had players that were going into grocery stores and they would hear people in the next aisle talking about them and this. How do you manage that? Um, 
you know, communicating with it was it was unbelievable what was going on there for at least a couple weeks when it started just real and just how much they were bombarded. Um, it's um, but what was really cool was it was all about our players mental and physical safety from the very get-go of our from our administration it was all hands on deck it was a 24 hour 24 7 thing for dozens of people within our athletic department of uh, trying to help them there wasn't any blame or anything else like that and so it was an unusual season to say the least but then you step back and you're like, oh, we went 19 and one in the Big Ten. You're two points away from going to your fourth Final Four in a row. Um, with all of this that we're having to deal with, new people coming in, new leadership, new system. Uh, I this is as successful as a season that I think in that I think I've ever been a part of, and it's because it was one of the most challenging and when you're going through tough things together and you see people rising up to those challenges under really difficult and public, very public and embarrassing situations, uh, we were days away from losing our team. We had a meeting with our, I mean, that's where it was in the middle of the season. We were at a meeting with our captains and they were just, just exhausted. They were just exhausted. And uh, it just there were just so much negativity and just so much dread and things that it felt like, you know, we were days away from just the heck with this. And for them to just babble and stay together and believe and, and encourage each other was a lot of support from administration and staff to come out of that. It was just it was uh, uh, one of the most rewarding seasons I've ever been a part of. And how were there, what was it that helped bring that together? Because that's pretty amazing. And did did the impact lessen? Did, the, did it slide into the background ever? Or was it still always on people's minds right through all of the successful part of the season as you played it out? I would say that the, the lowest point maybe for our team, the most, uh, I think it was probably the day before Nebraska when, when we beat, swept them at our place. I mean, that was, I mean, that was the, um, uh, that was a point where we were just spending so much time um, uh, on, on things other than volleyball. What brought it together? I mean, I, I don't know if I, I'm going to go too much into the details on that. It's a great question. Uh, but a lot of it, I think, needs to stay probably personal and within within the group. It just, you know, it just a lot of uh, uh, love and care for each other and, and being there. A lot of administration, uh, so many. But it was it was tough. I mean, these guys were getting and still still to this day getting bombarded with stuff on social media and. Um, uh, the amount of followers, what the cruelty that they were hearing from people, that their parents were hearing from people, uh, the cruelty that their boyfriends were hearing from people. Um, it's a, uh, uh, it is slowed down, but it, it, but it's still a part of their daily lives right now. No, no doubt about it. Mm. You mentioned it was a tornado of activity there at the start of the season when you start learning about all this. So, so as a coaching staff. Uh, how do you approach a season that starts with so much chaos? How do you even approach that? Well, I mean, there's, it, it's, uh, <laughs> I don't know, there's a magic bullet, right? I mean, you know, we talk about adversity school and, and how we deal with things, how we respond. Re respond is, is, a, is a phrase we use a lot. You know, how, how are we going to respond to this? How are you going to respond to the, the good times, tough times, you know, things that you that you can only plan for so much. And it's, you know, it's a it's life. Right. And, um, you, you know, and so um, there is a uh, it's got to come from a place that, hey, I we care about your well-being. I mean, uh, players need to know that right from the get go. Nobody's to blame. We, and it's um, we, we care and love, love each other here. And, and, and uh, 
and uh, you know we're all going to respond differently, and and that's going to be okay. And, and you know, and you're also bringing in people that had nothing to do with that in the past, right? And they're having to just deal with some of the public stuff, but also just sitting through all these meetings. And so it just it's how do you bring an entire group through that and and lock in on some things? But at the end of the day, it became our escape, the gym being around each other. It, it, it got to be that point where um, they didn't have to worry about some things. And and that became comforting. Yeah, and, you know, every season ends and, and the page turns. And you, as coaches, you're always coaching your current team and coaching in your mind the one that's next year and the year after and the year after that and counting scholarships and all that. And the transfer portal opens. Uh, yeah, you, you barely get to finish one season, and you're studying all that. And you obviously yeah. you made a big addition Christmas Day, and that seemed like it came up pretty suddenly. And uh, go from there as you you start to move forward with the, your team. And I think you you got the addition in uh, Carter Booth, who kind of fits the biggest hole in your lineup. And, and how do you see it all fitting together short term here? Right after the season used to be our quiet time for coaches. Um, right after the season, right after the spring season, those used to be uh, um, times that you can, and, and it's not anymore with the portal. It, it's it's crazy. I mean, last year after we won the championship, you know, we're the, the next day we're, we're talking with Caroline Crawford who committed right then, you, you know, it's, uh, you know, there's the, it's, um, you know, when the portal happens and there was, I don't know, there's it's got to be over 700 people in the portal, uh, right? I mean, it's a, it's a massive amount of, uh, of people. And um, I think we have, uh, when Gary or Britt, those are the two that are on the portal. I, I don't know how to get to it. I've never been on it. But th those guys will send me a message or something or a group up a message and say so-and-so's in. Uh, I'll send a two sentence email. I think I've sent five or six of them uh, this year. I just, hey, I saw that you're in the portal. If you're interested in talking, let me know. And uh, and that's it. And then it balls in their court. And, you know, and if, if I hear back from them, they, uh, hey, yeah, I'm interested in talking. Here's my number. Then, then we'll set up a call. Um, uh, Carter was was one of those that we sent an email to. Uh, I heard from her uh, pretty quick. Said, "Yeah, I'm interested in talking, but I got a final here <laughs> in about four minutes. Let me let me take the final and and uh, and then let's chat." Um, the calls right now from from when people go on the portal, it happens really quick, especially if they're going in that final, that next semester, like Crawford did, um, like Carter. Uh, those are conversations that are just boom, boom, boom. I mean, you might have a few conversations within a, a couple of days and, and then things are going. Sarah Franklin, she didn't go in that next semester. So she stretched hers out. Our conversations probably lasted a, a month or so. Um, uh, um, but it's it, there's not a lot of BS. You get right to the point. Um, uh, the... Uh, when people are going in the portal, um, you know, I think there's a misconception that pe that there is a lot of, well, uh, you know, NIL plays a huge part of it. I haven't seen that at all. With that, I mean, um, there's very little talk on NIL um, when we're talking with, with players um, from either end, at least in our conversations. Um I've not heard of anywhere, any schools or anything, any of our ki any kids that we've ever talked to that none of our players, when I ask about the portal, I've had, I had a recent conversation with our players of, hey, are there other schools that are trying to come in and grab you? You know, is there tampering going on? Is anybody going about things illegally or things like that? None of our kids uh, they said that's been a non-factor. I mean, you know, I know we read about this and everybody thinks that that happens a lot. None of our kids have been in that situation. Uh, I just, I don't see it much in our sport. Maybe it, maybe it happens in other, in other sports, 
but tampering and illegal stuff, I'm not, I'm not seeing that. NIL, I don't think is a, is a big deal. Most of the times, the kids that we're talking to, they're used, we're not talking to too many of them that it's about playing time either. But if they're going to come and play for us, it's they're probably playing somewhere else. So I, I'm sure that that's a factor. There's a factor in Jade Demps transferring. Certainly, she wanted to play a little bit, a little bit more than than what she thought might be available for her here. Um, but I'd say most of the time, it's that they, they want a uh, maybe it's not a great fit with either the coach. I'm not talking about Carter right now. All right, I'm just talking about over the past couple of years when we talked to you know quite a few p- kids over there. M- most of them, it's probably about the coach or the connection with the team, the culture. Um, those would probably be the top two, uh, I would say. Um, r- playing role, uh, ability to win a championship. Uh, I'm not hearing much of that either with our kids. Uh, maybe that's because they can go to a lot of schools that, that are going to win a championship. But I'm not hearing them say, I'm leaving this school because they're not good. And I'm going to go to this other school where I've got a chance to win a championship. I'm not hearing that very much. Um, and certainly not much about the portal. Um, it's, a, uh, it's usually about fit is is what most of the kids are and it seems to be where people are it's 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 uh i know fans don't like it when players come and go you know from our program or you know i'm sure other programs and things but it's it's uh i don't think it's a lot of uh anything deviant that is happening or big money is being thrown around behind the scenes to get people to leave I'm, we're certainly not at that point yet I've got a couple of questions on the portal. Um, so you talk about there's really not, you, you mentioned most of it is about is about fit. Um, so what is that conversation then then like when when you have like just a couple of emails back and forth? Is it is it all about fit? Is that all you guys kind of talk about? Like, hey, how can we help? Or um, what, what are those conversations mainly consist yeah. of? Yeah, it's, it's um, I don't really talk for me personally. I'm sure it's different ever, everywhere. I mean, I don't talk about much of the past or things. I don't really care about that. It's it's more of a, you know, all right, if you're going to transfer, it's got to work. Then the second time has to work. All right. So what is it that you're looking for? Um, we're not trying to sell anybody on anything. Uh, it's it, this is who we are. This is what we're about. This is what we're trying to do. And, uh, and if it's a good mix and it's a good mix and if it's not, that's, that, that's fine too. Um, you know, it's a, um, um, I think, I believe that kids usually end up where they're supposed to. Um, and, uh, you, you know, but the conversations is a little bit of here. This is what we value as a program. This is what, uh, this, is what our team is trying to do and what we're trying to be about and, and, um, you, you know, and it's, it's pretty simple with that. And then w- we get them in connection with some academic people. And, um, you know, we, we might have a conversation with somebody with, you, you know, what are, what are NIL opportunities? We've done that with a couple of our kids, but not all of them. It's, it just hasn't come up. Um, you know, come in on a visit, check it out and, Let's go. We will have them have some conversation with some of our players. And uh, yeah, it's 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 not real complicated on, on our end. The uh, the portal is kind of a complicated roster management, hasn't it? Uh, where you used to be able to have a freshman class that matches a senior class going out and or you got three opening up. So you bring in three. Now you're never quite sure, and we we've seen like most publicly Ohio State, who basically has their potential fifth year class with an All American or walking out the door, two All Americans, because they don't have room for them anymore. And so as you're, I assume you don't want to get in that spot where you got to tell foundations of your program and say, well, we can't take you anymore, and you you don't you can't tell kids who've committed and signed to play for you that, well, now I guess we don't have room for, how do you manage all that? And 
your own situation right now with one one departure, one coming in. How much room do you have for wiggle room? And and you don't have a lot of probably obvious playing time available for people. Just all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's hey, it's it's my job to continue to find ways to get better, right? And to help the players that are here grow and and reach their potential. We don't promise playing time to anybody, anybody. It's just we're honest and we're open when it's we we deal with those kinds of conversations. It's a, uh, uh, but but people know that coming in, you know, it's a uh, they they uh, the key the 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 critical part for coaches is to be honest with them up front so that everybody knows the, the the lay of the land and then they can make the decisions that are best for them and then to communicate every step of the way. Um, it's, uh, I think that's one of the reasons why we don't have a lot of people that are transferring out. You know, Jay, Jay transferred out. It was a great conversation at the end. We hugged it out. Uh, she might stay for the, for the spring semester. If she does, she's still going to be on scholarship. Uh, you know, although we don't have to do that. We're under a no obligation to do that. Um, but she's been so important for our program. And she has grown so much as a person. We're just really proud of her. She recognizes how much she's grown as a person. She recognizes that we don't want a national championship without her. You know, how she led this year behind the scenes, how she was going about things on a daily basis is things that we will talk about as a program moving forward, you know, as an example of how to, how to go about things when, when things don't go your way. And she was an unbelievable teammate. So, um, you know, but you look at the final four and you had Texas that won it with, I think, five transfers in the rotation. Uh, Pittsburgh, I think, had four in theirs. Uh, San Diego had four in their rotation. Louisville had their starting setter and their backup setter. And so it's a big part, you know, and, and the experience that all four of those teams had. They were very experienced teams. Um, and one of the things that's surprising me is you have elite players leaving elite programs. I never thought that that's where we would be when, when the idea of the portal came up a couple of years ago. But clearly that's where we're at. You're seeing really so seismic changes within programs and some <laughs> bits. So you, you better have room if one of these elite kids want to, want to come into your place. And so how do you find the balance of having a team that has transfers, that has incoming kids, returners, how to mesh those um, is an awesome challenge. You know, it's, it's fun. And, and um, uh, there's a, I don't know if there's a right or wrong way to go about it, um, but uh, it, you know, it's, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll continue to have a little bit of room on most years to be able to bring somebody of impact in and doing it in a way that, that we're not in the business of running people out here. I can tell you that, that that's not how we do things. Um, it's, uh, but hopefully if we're managing our scholarships in, in, in <coughs> classes in a certain way that we'll be able to, to, um, to have some room and we do i mean we still have room for one or two more kids this year if, if, uh, if the right one comes along yeah so there's a lot of roster management that now goes into effect for teams because of this transfer portal so i got kind of a two-part question are you afraid do you ever worry about a transfer coming in and having team chemistry be interrupted or disrupted and how do you handle that and it's kind of the second part i think you said there's something like or there were something like 700 student athletes in the transfer portal do you yeah. do you see like uh, like, does that keep getting larger and larger as the years go on? Or are we going to see like that kind of peak and kind of plateau for a while? What, what would that number even look like? Do you think? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know how many there were last year. The only reason why I know is, uh, that number this year is because of reading volleyball magazine. You know, I think they had a, a number out there. Okay. It's, a, um, so I, I don't know. Team chemistry. Yeah. Coaches better be worried about that. You, you better be, you better be, how, how do you, how do you do that? It's, you know, but all of our entire team knows who we're recruiting. I mean, it, it, you know, there becomes a point where it's like, Hey, uh, well, I don't know. Most of them didn't know about Carter. I was, it's a, uh, I'll, I'll get messages from players on our team that say, Hey, I just saw somebody got in the portal. Um, 
And uh, so they're, they're paying attention to it. Uh, when Carter committed, the first two people I heard from were both people that play her same position. Um, the person that recruited uh, Lauren Barnes the hardest on our team uh, was Tiffany Clark. The person that recruited um, Jocelyn Boyer the hardest on our team was Lauren Barnes. You know, people that played the same position. Um, you know, it's uh, uh, I used to tell Carlini and Hilly, hey, I'm, I'm recruiting somebody to, to play in front of you. And they both had the same answer. Good luck. You know, it's, it, it's a, uh, um, you know, we're all just, I, I, it, it's one of the key things about bringing people that are good fits for you mm -hmm. is we try to bring in people that it's not about the individual player. It's more about the team. And we're trying to do big things together. And most of them are all the way in. All of them have been. It's uh, of go out and get elite talent. And it'll be up to me to raise my game if I want to play in front of that person that's coming in. Now, as you look ahead, and there's obviously a chance for some a new piece or two to be added to the mix. But this past year, you switched systems with the two setters because largely you had such a depth up front to get everybody on the court uh, to make the best use of that, the highest ceiling. That front court number is the same. And uh, if, if Ella Robo progresses, it gets even more jammed. Uh, do you see that still being what would be the best system? It, would it be hard for somebody who's in there to not play? Or is that something that time will tell over the next months? I don't know. I, I've always looked at it as, I've always looked at it as a, um, a responsibility of the coach to get as uh, uh, much depth on a team as possible. And so that's something that, that uh, we're, we're constantly trying to do. Uh, system and whether we go with a six two or five one i don't know i mean it's a uh, you know not being coy it'll it'll be one of the fun parts to explore this spring and when we go over to europe in in the summer and and uh, you know if there's any additional pieces that that are coming in um yeah but you know players have to find ways to get better you know it's a, uh, they've got to continue to to grow yeah because there'll be there's other people not just from people that we're bringing in the people that are on the current roster that are that are you know working their tails off to, to improve their own game that's one of the parts i love about the spring is in the summer you can really separate yourself you know with from other people that play your position by how you're going about you know building your skills and and how much time that you're getting in the gym uh on your own or 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 so on and so forth so you really see some players that really take a big jump and then you see others that it's you know, uh, maybe because of health reasons or their, their, um, the amount of time they put in on their own game that they fall behind. And, uh, uh, but that's, that's one of the fun, fun things I've seen about how this all shape shakes out. Right. What, what is that like to put together a lineup and do you enjoy that process? Like what, what are you looking at when you try to put together the, the well, next season's lineup? What, what will numbers determine? What will what you see on the court? Like, how do you piece that all together? I, mean, I love it. I love it. It's a um, build team building. Uh, I, I I love it, and 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 it's it's organic and it grows and it changes, and um, um, you know because players' games are changing and and health comes into it and and so on and so forth, and so we look at stats. We're watching video. Certainly, we put people in different positions throughout the season, and then we see how they respond to those. So then, when the matches get really big, we we know <laughs> we've got information on that. Um, you know, there'll be times I'll ask players. That happens. You know, I ask the you know our uh, our two left sides. Hey, who do you feel a better connection with? Which setter? You know, I do the same thing with the middle. Um, you know, I'd ask Lauren. I ask the passers. Who do you feel comfortable with? Next, who makes you a better passer and who doesn't, you know? And so we'll ask that, uh, um, you know, uh, now we're not always listening to what, the, the, you know, or we're listening, but we're not, not always taking that into account. I remember 
Barnsey was really upset when uh, when Jocelyn Boyer was out of the lineup. You know, she she really liked Joss back there with her. And, uh, you know, it had nothing to do with Jade or anything else. When we went with that, she just felt she was a better passer with Joss out there. But we'll take those into account, right? I'll ask, I'll ask our passers, who's our best servers? So if I'm bringing in a serving specialist, <laughs> who, uh, um, who are the toughest ones for you to serve day in and day out, ball in and ball out? And so not just, you know, one wicked ball, at, you know, and then they go cold for a while. So, I mean, stats, video, knowing the personalities of our players, who leans into tough situations, and then we'll ask teammates uh, at, at times. Yeah, just uh, following that, your uh, serving specialist floated around throughout the course of the season, sometimes within the same match, sometimes in a, the next rotation around, you, a different one would serve. Was it what you're seeing that day? Was it who you're targeting on the other side? What kind of serve you think somebody does better than the other one? Yeah, and then part of it just, you know, have, I wanted to get as much information as possible throughout the season. And, uh, and, then, and then, you know, so some of it is serving, but some of it is, all right, uh, are they able to defend after their serve? Are they able to step in there and take a second ball if, if needed? Can they extend rallies? Um, you know, and so it, it, it was it was all of that. And we put a lot of different people, a lot of different serving scenarios um, throughout the season. Um, some of it, like when we got down to the regionals, we were flipping, uh, so Chanel and... Um, Jocelyn became our two servers that we went with. And theirs, because we were having different matchups on the other side and where we wanted to get the ball into, um, was uh, was dependent on the matchup. So one time Chanel would go in for one of our servers and the next set she'd go in for a different one. And it was because of that. Um, the uh, match point against Penn State, getting Jocelyn into that rotation was purposeful. And on match points, she knew she was going to ace them. I knew she was going to ace them. It's a, uh, she had so much confidence in, in exactly what she was going to do with that ball, a drop serve right into this Bermuda Triangle area. And so when she goes back to her serve, I gave her the serving zone. She gives this little smirk. I asked her about it afterwards. I go, what were you thinking? She goes, I knew I was going to ace them right then. <laughs> we, don't, we don't try for aces. You see me, and right after I gave her the zone, I start walking towards the net. Right out of the corner of my, my eye, I see her serve. The ball goes, and I point to the ground before the ball even gets to the net because I knew Jocelyn was – She's the best on our team of hitting that serve, and it was it, it was so much fun. Uh, you know, and her and I were connecting afterwards on that. We were la really laughing about it again last week. Um, but she is really, really good at that drop serve, especially cross court. And there was a um, she wasn't serving into that. Uh, so we were trying. Some, sometimes those those things happen when uh, you're trying to figure out. Who, who's going to serve into what rotation. Wow. I got to look back at that. I want to see that. I'm going to go check out that video now some point today and watch <laughs> you kind of walk toward the net like that. You know, you brought up, you, you said there in that answer, you know, we don't try to get aces. And it, it got me thinking about a question because I actually had a fan reach out on, on social media kind of, you know, asking about, hey, when's the next time you're going to talk to coach? Because I would just love to learn volleyball stuff. And uh -huh. so it got me thinking, what is one of the top things – about the way you play the game of volleyball your team plays um that you'd like fans to know a little bit more about because i think fans when you mentioned when you mentioned aces i think fans look at the stat sheet and they say eight aces seven errors or whatever uh they were fine or you know whatever that would be but it's it's much more than that when it comes into serving so what are some of the top things about the game of volleyball that you wish fans would maybe kind of look at it from a different perspective uh i i yeah, I think our I think our box score is, is really poor in our sport. Uh, how we educate, certainly, you know, serving, 
you know, there's an element of, of serving uh, aces and errors, but what are people passing off of our, your serve would be is one thing. And then what are they first ball siding out? What percentage are they first ball siding out off of your serve? Uh, from a passing perspective, it's just basically reception errors. But, you know, are you um, are you passing ones? Are you passing twos? Are you passing threes? You know, is a, uh, you, you know, do you, when, when a ball, when a passer is passing a ball, um, how many options does, does that setter have? And what are you first ball siding out off of, uh, off of their pass? Um, the other thing is just hitting percentages off of somebody else other than your setter taking a ball. That was one of the things that Golche was probably as good as maybe better than anybody in the country at is in, in a 6-2 having somebody that is that, I mean, we were hitting, we were hitting over 200 points higher off of her taking a second ball than we were anybody else other than a setter. Uh, taken off every everybody else on our team we were hitting negative off of and we were hitting over 200 off of her you know and so those are things that that play into uh, decisions and uh, playing time and, and those things that nowhere to be found right no nowhere to be uh, to be found on on how we uh, uh, we show our game yeah that's one of the frustrations from my end because I know, Serve what little I learned right from the start was whoever serves and passes best usually wins, and yet the stats all I can refer to is how many aces and how many errors because I don't know what people passed that's not available to me. Um, and so it's always kind of tricky to write about things when you don't have anything to quantify it. And well, it Dennis, is I think 29. I think 2019, our championship match against Stanford was kind of a, a great example that it, you're right. Uh, I'm programmed to think the same way is serving and passing wins. And that's how that, that's that's how I came up with the people that that I've been around. You value that so much. And, um, you know, and we dominated Stanford in the championship and serve and pass. I mean, dominated it. And they dominated us in on the final score. Um, your left sides have to be able to put the ball away, or your pins do when you're in non-perfect situations. Uh, that's becoming a really important um, situation. Uh, we were uneven in our serve and pass game this year. There'd be times that we were really, really good serving, and there's times that we just weren't. And uh, there were times that we were excellent passing and there are times that we're really really poor at it um, so we had to find other ways to win and um, you know there were other ways this team was extraordinary there are other ways that this team was as good as anyone in the country or any team I've had um, but we had to find other ways to to, um, to be great if you if, if you will um, Kelly, enjoy your time in Chile. Uh, can we end this podcast with watching the Jocelyn Boyer ace against Penn State? Would you be? <laughs> you have that? Let's see it. That'd I brought great. it up. If you're watching on Spotify or on YouTube, you can watch with us. All right. So I pulled it up here. I'm not sure how well you can see this, but we're going to watch for watch for Kelly up near the bench as Boyer serves the game winning ace. It's, it's amazing. So Boyer serves. Yeah. <laughs> And right as it's crossing, you're you're getting down, kind of like getting down, crouched down, and pointing to the ground. It was, it was that was awesome. I can't believe I never noticed that before. Uh, I don't I don't know if I've ever done that in a match where <laughs> uh, you know um, again you're just there are times like I'll, I'll give you one. Um, we were playing. Uh, uh, who, who was that? Um, uh, Illinois, I think it was the fifth set against Illinois. Liz Gregorski goes back here and serves, and they yeah. were passing two. And we were giving her a cross court serve, and their bro, Lauren Barnes' sister, was in the one zone, and she makes this really big move, like she's going to go and, you know. I want you to serve down the line. And so she was giving massive amounts of line. And I see her do that. 
We win the rally. We go back here, and I said, I think she's just going to do a fake yeah. and then go back. And so I gave Liz the exact same serve. Well, then I'm thinking, all right, she doesn't think that we're going to go back down the line. So she's not, she's going to actually commit to that. Yeah. And so we gave Liz, Liz is the best that I've ever had at this, of facing one way and serving another way. And we both knew right then, I mean, it was, it was setting this up. And so she goes and faces the cross court and does this no looky cross body down the line. Yeah. And Barnes is just flying through the air to try to keep from getting ace. You, but you've got to go on a serving run for that to happen, right? Yeah. And Liz and our team was able to do that. So that was a scenario this year that you knew you had a server that was going to be able to execute something that you're looking at a high likelihood of an ace right there. Uh, the next one was that serve with Joss. Her ability to pinpoint uh, a serve into a rotation uh, in that scenario, you just you just knew what was going to happen uh, beforehand. And when you have players that can do some of that, and, and we're talking about two people that don't get a lot of glory, right? I mean, those aren't headliners. Those two work in, in so many of our players, they work day after day after day after day on their skills and their technique to be able to execute. Those are both fifth set moments that we're talking about. And um, um, it's it, it's one of the things I love about our sport. It's truly the, the greatest team sport there is. Very cool. It's there's those little uh, things that we don't think about or don't even notice as fans watching the match of so those little the chess match that's that's happening and all those, you know, what you're watching and seeing from the other team. That's so fun. So cool. Well, Kelly, thank you for, for recapping uh, the 2022 season, kind of looking ahead at what's in store here for 2023 with the addition of, of Carter Booth. And I'm not sure exactly, you know, when will we know the final roster? Is that is that something that how long does that take? When you see no more bingos. <laughs> okay. So it, keep an eye on the bingos. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I don't know. I'd say um, uh, we're talking to two more players right now. We've got some conversations going on. Uh, these these would be names that obviously everybody would know. Um, and, uh, you know, and it's it's kind of on, on their timelines, uh, I guess, a little bit. And, and if we get one or two of them, that's that's awesome. If not, man, I really like I like the makeup of our team right now. I mean, I'm really excited about uh, you know you think about the players that we have, and very few of them are on their last year of eligibility, right? I think Izzy may be about the only one that mm -hmm. everybody else has two or three years left. Uh, you know, I'm really excited that Cardo will, will be getting started here in a few weeks. Really excited about Sage Damro. I think her future is really, really incredible. She just, she just had a little procedure done, so we've got to get her healthy and and back. But she's going to be a great Badger, um, you know. So you got two additions here, and we've got room for a little bit more. But uh, we should be a pretty experienced team, and uh, and. Um, uh, I'm a, and people that I really enjoy working with. Okay. All right, Kelly. Well, once again, thank you so much for taking the time to, to do the podcast here today. And, uh, we'll talk to you probably again in the off season. Thanks guys. We'll see you. All right. There you go. That's Wisconsin head coach, Kelly Sheffield and Dennis Punzel from the Wisconsin state journal. Thanks to both of them. As you see my lovely wall, um, not wallpaper. What is this Christmas wrapping? paper. We had a photo shoot for the family. So that's why I've got that. Thank you for listening to the podcast. Thank you to uh, Ian's Pizza, three locations in Madison and three in Milwaukee. Check out Ian's Pizza and go check out their specialty slices of pizza. Also, johncastpodcast.com is the website. Go sign up for the newsletter. I'm not going to spam you. I'm only going to tell you when the cool stuff happens, like the latest episodes. And I'm going to tell you when we have the latest promotions. So go check out johncastpodcast.com. Rate and review. That really does help. I really appreciate everyone who has rated and reviewed this podcast. And it takes seconds. You just get on the phone. You tap the, tap the five stars or four. 
uh, you know, just rate it. If you want to go below that, fine, I guess it, it, you're going to pull that. But uh, just go rate and review on Apple or on Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcast. So once again, thanks to you for listening to the JohnCast podcast. See ya.